So the first talk is going to be uh, Spence Spencer and Samir. So Spence is from U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, and Samir is from GitLab, and they are going to be talking about the journey, the DevOps journey at USPTO. Fantastic. All right. All right, let's get started. HDMI, yeah. Technology. Uh -huh. The magic. So, Spence, how about it? Let's do a selfie. Yep. Actually, Adrian asked me to do that, so yes, please. Perfect. All right. I got the lock screen on the selfie, though. Yep. <laughs> Hopefully. All right, so. Old eyes. Yeah, amazing technology, right? Smartphone. I just upgraded it last night, and uh, it's, it's working, so that's a good thing. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, you know, this morning I woke up, and my son was looking at it, and it was kind of upgrading, and he goes, this is cool. And I said, yeah, it's really cool. It's like, it's the best thing to slice bread. And he just looked at me funny like, what? you know, he's a five-year-old, so sliced bread to him is just like, wow. Um, so the funny story about sliced bread is that uh, U.S. Patent and Trademark Office issued the uh, patent for slicing a whole loaf of bread to Otto Rowetter in the 30s, 1930s, for some of you who probably weren't born at that time. Uh, <coughs> and neither was I, by the way, so. Uh. Anyway, at that time, USPTO had issued roughly two million patents. So in the 1930s, that's how much uh, they had done. And then uh, in 2021, height of the pandemic, right? Nobody wants to talk about it. I know, I don't want to talk about it, but I want to give a time reference. The, uh, they issued the 11 millionth patent. So think about how many went through in, in a roughly uh, little less than 100 years and how many more patents are coming through. And that's just patents. Then there's about roughly 3 million uh, trademarks running around. So that's, that's kind of cool stuff. But, you know, we, I don't want to talk about patent because that's Spence's uh, territory. I want to talk about the smartphone. And uh, I mentioned that, <clears throat> excuse me, I mentioned that I upgraded last night. If you think about about 10 years back, maybe 15 years back, when we had those, remember those clamshell phones? Those were really cool. Imagine doing your social media on it. You know, hashtag DevOps DC. Uh, yeah, I don't think that would have worked at that time. But if you think about it today, I just, did a selfie, I'm probably gonna post it on a bunch of social media, and I'm gonna have it out there. So if you think about how our culture has changed, you, did the tool come first, or did the culture come first? That's a question you need to think about, because a lot of people think, oh, I could have done that with my clamshell, and they still walk around with clamshells, that's great, you know, it works for them. That's wonderful, but they probably can't do 99% of what you can do in the palm of your hands with a single tool that got upgraded last night and all my stuff is new. I got new email, I got new backgrounds, I love this new background I got. Um, it's really cool to be able to keep up like that. So what comes to mind in all of this is innovation, right? Innovation, and what better federal agency to talk about when talking about innovation. Patent and trademark office, guys, think about that, right? They help innovate in the industry. They've been doing that for 200 years. So not only do they help industry innovate, they themselves are extremely innovative. And so with great pleasure, I'd like to introduce Spence, who uh, was introduced already, uh, to talk about the USPTO journey. Thank you, Samir. Thanks. Samir is a great partner for us, and GitLab has been a great partner for us. So 
I'm going to share, it's really two journeys, but it's a story of two journeys that happened at the same time. Uh, this starts roughly two, and a, two years and three months ago. I came back to Patent and Trademark Office after a brief stint at the National Weather Service. I had previously been at Patent and Trademark for six and a half years before I went up there. I came back to a great team, and I came back to a great place, and some really funny things happened a couple of months in, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Before we go there, though, I'm going to talk a little bit about the CIO organization at Patent and Trademark Office. This is a little bit about what we do. We are 700, roughly, federal employees, around 1,500 contractors, just short of $700 million annual IT budget. I'll note that that is not tax money. We are entirely fee-funded. We only get the funding that we earn. Um, <clears throat> This year, our CIO has set three IT priorities for us, cybersecurity, resiliency, and cloud. That governs or guides everything we do uh, in the CIO organization. Uh, I'll, I'll also point out at the bottom of the slide at about the 630 position, uh, there's new ways of working, which is half of what I'm going to talk about today. Um, we'll get more into that in a little bit. I have to go back in history a little bit to around 2014. This is actually our second Agile journey at Patent and Trademark Office. We started a series of programs that we called the Next Generation Systems back in 2013-2014. And we spent a lot of money and did a lot of development. Uh, the, I, the, the end goal was to replace the line of business systems that the patent and trademark examiners and our public-facing customers use to do business with us. That was the first try of DevOps at USPTO. Some of you who've attended earlier DevOps days may remember we've hosted this event at our house in the past. I hope we can do so again in the near future. Uh, I think it would be really cool to be back in the, in the, the building again. We built our first uh, CI and configuration management system using this guy, who probably everybody in the room who's ever done anything with DevOps knows about. Uh, we built a thing called continuous integration and configuration management. The idea was that we would allow teams to use predefined pipelines to automatically build and do some limited uh, functional testing with the software products they were developing. Um, and to deploy into production, sort of on demand, not exactly on demand. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But it didn't really work out because we had to learn a lesson at, at, at the end of that journey. And to talk about that lesson, I'm gonna introduce a concept of new math. I'm a, I'm a child of the 60s. I, I went to school in the 60s and in kindergarten, they taught us this thing called new math. It's calculus in disguise but it's really a new way of looking at math. This is a new way of looking at a business problem. I'm gonna prove or I'm gonna show that 99 can e equal zero. And that seems really strange on its face, but when we think in terms of business value, software that's 99% complete but not delivered to our customers is of zero value. That's very important. It governs everything we do. Our business unit partners, who are the ones that fund us, reminded us that we have to focus on delivery of value to the business to be of value. And they hit us right between the eyes with that lesson. They took a lot of our money away. So our new CIO, Jamie uh, Holcomb, focused us on delivery. And as an illustration of the executive commitment to delivery, uh, I'll show a quote from our deputy CIO, Debbie, C Debbie Stevens. The words are great, but the important lesson here is look how often the word deliver or delivery occurs in this short quote. It's basically one paragraph. I think it's two, two long sentences. Deliver or delivery shows up three times in that short quote. This went to CIO Magazine, CIO.com, uh, back in June of this year. That shows how focused our executives are on delivery of business value. So it's all about delivery. 
Um, another way of showing that is our, organization, our organizational structure, and I'm going to upstage our CIO slightly uh, because this is a new name for my organization. It's actually going live today. It hasn't been announced to the world. <laughs> Hi, Stefan. Um, under the office of the CIO, we are now the Business Product Delivery Office. We were formerly, up until this morning, we were known as Application Engineering and Development, I think. No, no more. It's all about delivery now. So we're the Business Product Delivery Office. That's an SES under Stefan Michev. Stefan is here. You can wave if you want, Stefan. Under Stefan, we are, our, our product is the delivery services product. That's the uh, agile team that, deli that, that delivers the product that I work on. And my division is the system configuration and delivery automation division. We support the agile delivery platform component. Look how often the word delivery occurs there. It's really all about delivery. Nothing else matters. In March of 2020, we were about a month into my time coming back to PTO. We got an email that told us don't come in the building anymore. There's this pandemic thing. It's scary. Everybody's getting sick, right? So we all, we had a long telework culture at PTO. The patent and trademark examiners have been doing it for, gosh, more than 10 years now. Um, trademark examiners were something like 99% remote before the pandemic. Patent examiners were, I want to say something in the high 80s. They're located all over the United States, both the patent and trademark examiners. And we had a strong telework culture in the CIO office. That's really important because when we went from being in the office, an in-person organization, literally overnight to fully remote, we weren't even allowed in the building. We took our laptops home, we put our slippers on, we sat at our desks with our dogs by our feet, and we kept on going, and we didn't miss a step. And the important thing is in the two years plus that we've gone into fully remote, while we're doing an agile transformation that, I talked to, that I'm gonna talk about in a minute, we didn't miss a step. We did every single business function that PTO has ever done. We hired people, we let people retire, we turned over contracts, we issued patents and trademarks, didn't miss a step. We had a little bit of a rough time with our VPN, but our CIO made a bold decision to invest big and we haven't gone back. We're still fully remote. On May 25th of this year, we rolled out a new telework program, uh, eligible, posi eligible positions within the CIO and the chief admin office can work up to five days a week, full telework from anywhere in the United States, and that includes Puerto Rico. Uh, one of our folks did work from Puerto Rico for a couple of months, I guess it was, two different times. We have a full-time staffer in my division that's in California right now. His, his new office is in Santa Rosa, California. Uh, he came to us from there and he went back there. That's pretty cool. So the agile part of it, we instituted what we call new ways of working. It changes, this is a very uh, unusual way for a government organization to develop software. We switched from a project-based planning and funding model to a product-based planning, funding, and operational model. We formed roughly 220 autonomous agile teams. Each one is responsible for a product or a component of a product uh, within our landscape. And they do everything from interfacing with the business to gather requirements, to developing the software, to testing the software, to deploying the software, to operating the systems behind it. So it's all the way from planning to sustainment. That's very important. So we really did, you know, we went to DevSecOps uh, and the, the SEC part is important. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But our focus now is on the frequent incremental delivery of business value every day. Agile Manifesto, I'm just gonna put it up. We live by this. Our, uh, the, the important thing to me here is the first bullet, individuals and interactions over processes and tools. We cannot do DevOps successfully if we maintain the same processes, at least on the government side, that we did in the past. Those old slow processes with lots of approval 
and lots of steps, they don't work if you're trying to deploy several times a day. You don't have time to go to a change board. This is a guide that we used when we were transitioning to new ways of working. We call it the Agile House. I think there's nine phases up here. But it really, the only reason I put this up is to show that the transition to DevSecOps involved every facet of the IT business, planning, budgeting, staffing, operations, measurement of results, maturity, stabilization, all of it, it's right there. We, we start from a technology foundation, we gather business requirements from our users, we implement that software, we deploy it, we sustain it, we maintain it securely and resilient. I spoke earlier about the need for a culture change. There's a very old pro, uh, principle in software development called Conway's Law. It says that, Conway's Law roughly stated says that an organization tends to build systems that resemble the structure of the organization doing the building. That's important for DevOps. If you're gonna build DevSecOps systems, your organization has to look like an organization that runs on DevOps. Remember I talked about those autonomous teams. The team autonomy is very important if you're gonna succeed in doing this. Um, a rigid organization will always struggle to be agile. So if your processes get in your way, like happened to us in 2014, you're not gonna be able to deploy frequently. And that frequent incremental delivery is the key to success. So when we started to stand up the product teams, we realized that we didn't have the right shared base of knowledge. So the Agile Delivery Office, now called the Transformation Delivery Division, I think I got that right, uh, agreed that every Agile team as they launch would go through a six-week dojo process to get them that common base of knowledge so that they knew what to do in a daily scrum. They knew what a daily scrum meant. They knew how to plan user stories. They knew how to associate those with features and epics. They knew how to do quarterly and annual planning so that they could show the business that we we're delivering the value that they want from us. So that's very important, that dojo step. I don't think we would have succeeded without the dojo. And we're actually calling some teams back into the dojo now because we realized we missed some training steps the first time around. So some of the technical steps involved in DevOps, we're pulling them back we're showing them how to use some of the testing tools and some of the quality tools. Locally, what we're building in the ADP product, and a little bit larger, this is really kind of my area of responsibility, it's a concept I call brains to browser. And it's a low friction value, I don't, I hate, I don't like the term value stream delivery platform, but it, it, that describes it pretty well. It really covers everything from gathering business requirements through the uh, devolving those into user stories, features, and epics, developing the code, testing and maintaining the source code, building the deployables in our build environment, enforcing our guardrails, and allowing the team to autonomously deploy that into production and monitor it and keep it healthy once it reaches production. Very important. And I'll talk about some of the little steps that we do to implement that. The first step, that, which is kind of new to us, is what we call developer experience. And the idea here is to provide the developers the tools uh, and processes that they need to build without frustration, and that's very important. Uh, one of the things that's an impediment to, the, to code development is the time developers spend where they're not being expressive and creative. So we're standing up uh, developer desktop machines that are connected into our lab environment uh, with pre-configured IDEs. Uh, we're going to give the developers some control over that desktop environment so that they can customize it to meet themselves. So some limited admin rights, I think, is where we're gonna go with that. And this is still a fairly new concept. And the idea is to be able to provide fast developer feedback, a short cycle time, so the developer makes a code change, they see it run the unit test, they get it deployed into a lab environment, they run the quality and security tests against it, and they find out relatively quickly how they did. So we don't have days and days and days of waiting between the time you write the code and the time you see whether it worked right or not. 
and whether it introduced a security vulnerability or not. That's very important. And some automated testing. One of the, one of the, the key things about the platform we're building is that as we deliver a product into that lab environment, we can kick off regression and functional testing right there as we deploy it. Those tests run and the developers get relatively quick feedback about how they did with regressions and with functional implementation. Source code. This is really where GitLab comes into it. GitLab is our source code management tool of choice. It is our repository record now. Um, however, with the new 15 version, there's a considerable amount of, I'll call it code quality, but they're not really code quality, they're software quality tools that are built into GitLab. So now we can do static vulnerability analysis before it even deploys to production. So if a developer does something that is unsafe, you know, an unbounded uh, uh, array or something like that, they'll see it at the time they commit. We can, do, we can do vulnerability analysis too. So you think back to the log4j that we had a few months ago. If, a, if a, uh, a product is calling in a vulnerable version of log4j, they know about it before it even deploys to the lab. It'll flag it and it'll break the build so they know they need to, to do something to make it right. And like I said, some regression and functional test integration right at the source code level. Our build environment is centered around autonomously managed pipelines. The product teams own their own build process. Uh, we, I would say it's more than a recommendation. We encourage strongly teams adopt a build once and deploy anywhere mindset. So in the old days, we used to rebuild our code as we promoted it up the stack. We would do a dev build and it would work. And then as we went to the lab environment into the test environments, we would rebuild those artifacts with new configuration for things like databases and external volumes in it. And then once they passed test, we would rebuild it a third time to go to production with the production resources. Effectively, what that means is that when you deploy that code into production, you're deploying untested code. It's never been function tested. Think about that for a minute. You talk about test in production, you wanna give your government partners hives, that's the way to do it. <laughs> we also incorporated packaging for deployment into the pipelines, war, jar, and tar file artifacts. We're moving toward the ability to build and manage RPMs within the, in the pipelines, and we're building container images as part of the pipelines today. Uh, we're implementing what we call software supply chain management. This is very timely. There's a, a memo that came out of OMB this morning that's mandating software supply chain management for all government agencies within 90 days. Guess what? We're already there, Stefan. We have this capability today. That's pretty cool. One of the things that we are moving toward is this notion of assured builds. We build software of defect-free components in a defect-free build environment that allows us to have a high assurance that what we put into our production environment has no defects, and I include software or, uh, security vulnerabilities under the general heading of defects. There is some indication that some of the late uh, unpleasantness, I'll say, with um, SolarWinds may have been introduced in a developer desktop environment. There were some undeclared dependencies that may have been incorporated into the SolarWinds management platform. We think that may have happened in the developer environment. So one of the things that we're gonna try to, to move toward is when you have a production build, we wanna make sure we build it in the pipeline environment. It's okay for a developer to build dev versions on their desktop in order to get their unit tests to pass. But once they commit to the source code management repo, the thing that we actually deploy into the server environments is built in a known defect-free environment. And something else that's new that we're trying to do is we're trying to get um, our arms around the production of ATO artifacts. That's an enormous amount of effort to get an ATO done anywhere in government. And when you do your initial system security and privacy plan, you have to document, what is it, something like more than 200, 220, 230 security controls. If we can produce some of that ATO documentation at pipeline runtime, that takes a lot of burden off the developers and they can focus on what they do well, which is developing code and delivering business value. The third facet is deployment. We're currently using GitLab CD uh, with an Ansible and Terraform uh, 
scripting. We've done this in collaboration with our cloud and infrastructure teams. Uh, it's important to note that the, the, even though the teams own the infrastructure as code, the actual production deployment mechanisms are still owned by the support teams and not the product teams. But the product teams have a lot of control over what they deploy and how it's deployed. Uh, we just maintain a little bit of a separation of concerns. Uh, we, we don't like to have committers actually deploying into production. And it's toward this notion of an automated, rapid, low friction deployment. And in the future, we have a product that we call virtual data as a service that's going to allow us to deploy data along with the code. So if you think about when you deploy your, your product into a test environment, there are, there's the technology in, in the market now where you can put a slice of test data with it that allows you to have a fresh copy of test data so you can do a full set of function and regression, regression testing. In the division, we have kind of a mantra that we live by, never send a human to do a robot's job. Automation is everywhere. We have to have automation everywhere. Automation ensures consistency and quality. Automation can reduce fear. And automation is also intrinsic documentation. So if you think about the old days where we had to do a run book of how you're gonna deploy something, how you restart it, how you manage it, if that's all done through code, that Ansible and Terraform code or whatever infra infrastructure scripting language you're using, that's documentation of how to run the system right there. And it runs itself largely. What's it worth, the business benefit? We get that frequent incremental delivery of business value. We shorten the lag time from the business concept to the production reality. We get that value into the hands of our patent and trademark examiners much more quickly. We build stability and resiliency. Think back to that first slide. That's two of Jamie's goals right there. And we have better quality. And like I said to me, quality also includes freedom from, soft, from uh, security vulnerabilities. And we're retiring some of our scariest legacy systems. If you've ever worked with the patent office, you probably know public pair. You might not know the pair user manager, but those are two of the highest risk systems we had. They were retired about two months ago. They're, done. They're gone. They're done. Uh, we retired our legacy identity and access management product. That was an enormous amount of money we spent maintaining that. It's done. We're retiring most of the legacy patent examiner tools by Halloween of this year. We expect to retire Palm by the end of fiscal 23, and we expect to retire TRAM, which is the trademark system of record sometime in 2024. TRAM, by the way, is so old, it's running on relatively new hardware, but the TRAM system is so old, it's written in ALGOL 60. We still run production on ALGOL 60. We're retiring that in 2024. That's amazing. We talked about going remote. On May 25th of this year, we implemented a new telework program that allows us to, to eligible positions to, re, to work remotely up to five days a week with no regular reporting requirement. I turned in the keys to my office. I don't have an office in a government building anymore. My entire division turned in their keys before September 1st. We have no offices in a government building. We burned our boats. So if you think back to the, to the legend of Hernan Cortez, when they landed ashore, they burned their boats, there's no turning back. We've done that, we've burned our boats, both in the agile DevSecOps world and also in the remote work world. GitLab was with us through that entire journey to remote. We have a bi-weekly cadence call with them. They're fully remote today, and we talked a lot about that. Samir and, and Susanna and uh, our Tam, Kevin Chassie heard us speak about our challenges as we went through all of that fear at the beginning and we eventually got our feet under us and we were able to keep going and eventually transition to fully remote. And that's now who we are. Uh, we've hired five team members, soon to be six, out of a team of 12 federal employees. More than, or almost half our team are people that onboarded remote from day one during the pandemic. And I'd like to recognize that team for a minute. Skidad folks, I know quite a few of you are in the, in the, in the audience. Could you stand up please so you can be recognized? Come on, Joe, stand up. These are the folks that made that reality. This is, this is my team. This is the best team in government right here. Thank you, folks. We burned our boats. 
And that's where we are. <laughs> Thank you. So I think we have uh, a little bit of time for questions. I see it's 10 o'clock, which I think is when we were due to end. Yeah, uh, we, have, we have a couple of minutes. We have a couple of minutes. To, to, are there any questions I can answer for anybody about what we did and how we did it, who we are? Wow, no questions. I've got a hand up here. The answer is really, the, the question was, are we still using Jenkins or have we moved on to another uh, integration environment? The answer is yes to both. Um, you may know that the CloudBees Jenkins platform is announced retirement at the end of June of next year. Um, we have both community Jenkins and CloudBees Jenkins in our stack. We're going to retire the CloudBees Jenkins component, but we're going to maintain community Jenkins uh, in a cloud environment for a limited set of pipelines that are difficult to migrate, I'll put it that way. But our main pipeline platform of choice is GitLab at this point. So we've got, I don't even know what our pipeline count is. I think totally we've got about 2,200 pipelines um, and we're migrating, any, any, all of them will go to GitLab essentially by June of next year. Another hand right here. That's correct. Is there, are you using infrastructure as a service to each one of those environments, or are you leveraging native tools and technologies from those environments? What is basically, what is the rationale mm -hmm. of using those three vendors if you're trying to get uh, solving vendors or what is the direction of it? So the rationale is really kind of manifold, I would say. Um, on the one hand, we want to be, in, as a government agency, we want to be independent of our vendors. Right, so things happen. You know, you you want to be you want to be able to really relocate your products to run really based on an economic decision more than anything else. So that's a driving factor. The other factor was we have a, a pretty long history with uh, Google Cloud. Um, the trademark public-facing search systems, the the um, TSDR system, which is the document retrieval system, that's been in Google Cloud for gosh, I think about eight or nine years. Um, so we have some legacy there. We have a lot of AI tools running in Google Cloud. Um, we are an O365 shop for our, our documents and uh, uh, internal email. So we already had an Azure presence. And honestly, in some ways, it's easier to do Microsoft on Azure. In some ways, it's not. In some ways, it's easier to do it in Amazon. I think it's easier to do it in Amazon, but I'm basically an Amazon guy. Um, but the, 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 the general principle is that we want to put the product in the right place for that product. Um, if it interacts you know, closely with Active Directory, probably belongs in Azure. Um, if it runs on a Microsoft virtual machine, it probably goes to Azure. We run Lambdas in AWS. We run containers on Fargate in AWS. We, run, we were running for a while. OpenShift container platform as a second container platform in AWS. We're moving away from that. Um, and it, like I said, it's really, it's, a, it's an economic decision. Oh, are we at time? Okay, we're at time. Yeah. Are, you, are you gonna be around during the break? I will be around. I, I'm, I'm gonna be here all day today and probably part of the day tomorrow. So catch me you know, out in the lobby or? Yeah, and maybe even pitch an open space later this afternoon. Sure. Well, we could do that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you.